My name is Eric Alexander. Um, I, I, along with my team here, I direct the Brigham Education Institute. I want to welcome everyone both within the Brigham and the Harvard system and anyone joining us outside of um, that region as well. It's a joy with Zoom to be able to reach farther than normal. So we're going to jump in. I'm going to set the stage here on what this next 50 minute period is all about. And time goes by awful quick. Uh, in the past, when we had done this last year as a live process, uh, we ended up taking a, about an hour and 15 minutes, but we've tried to compact it into 60 minutes here uh, for the sake of, I think, the effective use of Zoom and the virtual technology. And this is our first uh, session in the seven, seven uh, seminar series. So it will be uh, the process here that if we're doing education research, we have to design and then activate a project. And how do we do it? And I'm here with my co-host, which is Shuba Ramani and Ed Krupat and myself. Here's what we hope to do. Um, is to move beyond now this introduction uh, and uh, really what we're all about to um, Ed Krupat now talking about kind of a broad starting point. What are the 10 steps to successful research that lie ahead? And then we've asked our prize scholars, the four of them, um, to take their projects that they're just starting to activate for the year ahead and their ideas and to allow us as a community to work through kind of a step back consulting process. I'll talk about that here upcoming before we all go into breakout rooms, but the goal for them is to achieve the benefit of all of our input. And the goal for all of us is to understand how valuable it is uh, to take a group of colleagues and to step back and get insight into how to do a project successfully and get that insight early on before you move down to a scenario where you then have to take steps back to sometimes do it well. Shuba Ramani will then end with a discussion on the research uh, compass, and that will then lead us to some Q&A at the end, and hopefully we'll fit this in in 60 minutes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Ed Krupat to talk about 10 steps here towards successful research. Thank you, Eric. Uh, pleasure to see, see you all out there, at least virtually. Uh, what I'd like to do in the next eight to 10 minutes, so you, the, we're going to be moving quickly, is to give you a general overview of 10 steps from beginning to end to, that will generate a useful research project. Let's, let's go to the first one. Um, most important thing is clearly to find the research question you want to ask. I can't tell you how many times as a reviewer I've read a paper that had no focus, that had no center. If you define and specify a specific research question, all else will follow. And if you don't, all else will be muddled, to be perfectly honest. You do that, but then step two is bounce your ideas off colleagues, mentors, friends. Um, educational research, research in general, is a team sport. It's collegial. You'll almost never see a paper that's published by one person. It's unbelievable how, how rich the ideas become when, in fact, you do it with others. Step three, uh, consult the literature. Again, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, I've asked, do you know what, what's been done, what's in the literature? And they say, I'm gonna wait till I write it up to find that out. That is too late. Uh, when you consult the literature at the beginning, you get all kinds of wonderful insights. What's gone before? How can you build upon that? What did people do and find? What measures did they use? The literature should enrich your study and enrich it from the front end, not from the back end. Four, define generally what approaches you want to use. Um, the question is, am I, gonna, am I a quantitative person, a qualitative person, or do I want to mix method study, which is very popular, in which the two complement each other. That's just the general orientation. Then you go to step five, which is to solidify your research design. Say, do I need a control group? Is this a before or after study? Then you're starting, and we'll talk about this more, I'll come back to this, to really think about your research in detail. Once you've got that idea, you identify the measures and the instruments that you help, will help you answer your research question. If you're studying burnout, do you want to use the MASLAC instrument or some other instrument? Is there something else that's valid and reliable that you can use? 
And if there isn't something that answers the exact question that you want, can I develop my own measure and validate that, provide information in that, that will allow readers and editors to understand that you've used something good, new, and innovative and valuable. Step seven, uh, ask yourself, do I know how to analyze my data? I know what I'm gonna, how I'm going to collect it and whatever. Uh, if, it's, if you're a qualitative person, do you know how to do thematic analysis? And if not, you know, how do you find the help? If you're a quantitative person, do you know the difference between a t-test and a chi-square test? Um, do you have access to statistical packages that you need? Do you have access to expert resources? Um, you know, because you want to analyze your data well. Once you've analyzed your data, you want to make sense of it. This is where we start talking about write-up. And I've said what story you want to tell. And people often come back and say, a story? No, this is scientific writing, not writing a, a novel. But good scientific writing tells a clear story. Your introduction orients people and lets them know what's come before. Your methods allows them to understand exactly what you've done. So even if they wanted to replicate it, they could. Your results section tells of your findings, makes a clear focus about what we learned. And then your discussion section makes sense of that, interprets it, puts it into context, puts it into theoretical context or empirical context, and perhaps even suggests areas for additional research. Um, once you've done that, and you've gotten to step eight, uh, step nine is where you say, okay, now what am I gonna do with it? Um, am I gonna present it? Is there a meeting that I want to go to, local, national, regional? Um, and also, do I, is that meeting one of people in my discipline? Uh, or is it mostly educators? Or can you find a meeting that's got a little both? The same thing for a journal. Uh, most of us are not going to publish our stuff in the New England Journal. Uh, would be nice, but uh, they're usually more modest. But, uh, you know, where, what's the right thing to be aiming for? And again, you can get advice and you, others have experience on that. Once you get that far, write your first draft and know that that first draft is not going to be great uh, because you're going to be showing it to colleagues. You're going to be taking a step back and analyzing it yourself and know that the draft that you put together is likely to be, and that you send out, for instance, for review, is likely to be the second, third, fourth at least. And that, in fact, doesn't even count the revisions that likely journal editors are going to ask. Of you. So we've got things from beginning to end, but let's just take a minute or two to dig in more deeply. First of all, two types of research questions tend to dominate. Uh, one's in intervention-based research. And it's, there's a good chance that many of you are asking that, I have this new idea. I want to train people. I want to add this. I want to improve the manner in which, and I want to collect data to see if it was a success. Um, it's, some people call it evaluation, but I call it evaluation research. That's one kind of research. The other is curiosity in a way. It's associational. You want to know about the relationship between X and Y. The residents and attendings differ in their experience of diagnostic uncertainty. Uh, does empathy increase or decrease over time? Uh, so in fact, you're asking about the association between two variables or did something work and how can I collect data to evaluate it? Having those, next slide, um, you're asking yourself, what is, more specifically, the research design that I want to use? Now, randomized control is the, grand, the gold standard. It allows cause and effect. And in over 90, 95% of the time, it's, you don't have the ability to control everything in the messy world of educational research. So instead of an experiment, which is an RCT, do you want to do a quasi-experiment? Do you want to collect data before and after? And by the way, you have to decide so you remember to collect data in time before and versus 
also after your intervention. Is there a comparison or a control group? And who will serve as that comparison group? Do I want wait list controls, people who couldn't quite get, who I didn't have enough room for? Is it that you want historical controls, the people who went through it last year before we made this change? And again, that requires prior thinking to know well in advance to collect data. Or maybe there are people like the intervention group, they're matched controls. So all of these methods that, and or do you want convenience controls, people who I could just, people who I could get. All of these methods, other than the randomized control trial, have problems because they may open the explanation of your findings to confounds, to alternative explanations, to other reasons that may make sense. But, you know, once you get this far, last slide, um, you say, you know, can I publish it? Where? And what are the criteria that will make it publishable? Two criteria. One and both necessary. Is it a great idea? Is it interesting? Does it bring value added? Is it something that a journal editor will say is worth the pages? And number two is the question of, has it been done well? If you can get a great idea, carry it out well, you'll have a publishable study, you'll have a great medical education research career, and you know what else? You might even find it fun. Actually, those of us who do a lot of it, do it because we like doing it. So I encourage you to do it. And I also offer anybody who wants more consultation on this, that I'd be glad to sit down with you. And then I'm going to move on. I think I'm under my 10 minutes. Let's get things moving. That was a great introduction. And I think slides here that are always worth kind of referencing when you start any project. Um, so now the fun uh, middle portion of our, of our hour. With credit here, um, as many will probably reflect on and know, uh, credit here to the Macy Program for Healthcare Educators, which first introduced MEP back consulting. And let me just give a little bit of a, a framing to it. Um, so we're gonna break out into four different groups. And in each group, there will be a, a faculty lead, if you will, myself, uh, Christina, Shuba, and Ed. And there will also be um, uh, one of the four prize scholars so there'll be one in each group, one lead, one scholar, and those scholars are going to come with um, their project. Uh, each group is gonna have about eight to 10 or so of us on this uh, Zoom call. And our job uh, then when we get in is to quickly allow the scholar to describe their research project that they're hypothesizing and planning. And they'll have about two minutes to do that. They're also gonna try and pitch to us where they would like some input. What's a problem they're coming up with, an uncertainty, they're struggling a little bit. So we have a little focus. We can ask one or two or three you know, clarifying questions, but then the real issue is they have to step back. So they're gonna be flies on the wall for the next 25 minutes after that, while we as a group in the breakout room tries to kind of just think outside the box how to help them, how to answer those uncertainties or questions, and then at the end, they, the scholar will kind of come back in the group, just in this breakout group and say, here's what I heard and make sure they've crystallized that feedback. Then we'll come back to a group of 40 of us or so. So with those as our marching orders, I'm gonna ask Caitlin to put us into the four breakout groups. Welcome back everyone. And sorry, Alan, for cutting you off midstream on that. So uh, my turn to join this wonderful session. So just so you know, the step back consultation did not originate with the Harvard Macy program. It actually, uh, you know, Ballant, uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Ballant, two psychologists, British psychologists, Michael and Enid uh, Ballant, uh, they uh, designed these groups during the therapeutic sessions. So group therapy, that's, that's where it began. So the person presenting the problem would sit back and allow the rest of the group to think about, mull over the problem and produce, provide solutions. And then uh, Bob Keegan, he introduced this because he was an educational psycho a developmental psychologist um, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So he introduced this and then it's been a standing 
event in the Harvard Macy Project Group consultation for over 25 years now, and it really works. It's so amazing to just resist speaking and just listen. Um, next slide. So, uh, in fact, I want to uh, talk about the research compass very, very briefly, which will crystallize the, some of the points that uh, Ed had already uh, brought up. Next slide, please. So frequently what's happening is we generally think of a local problem or discover a local problem, and then we study it in the local context. And then we say, oh, we made a change. This Our program has made an impact and then live happily ever after. And then you send this paper to a journal and then the journal uh, editor sends it back faster than, you know, it's like Newton's third law of motion. And then you wonder, well, it was nicely written, nicely done, why did they send it back? Because we have not gone beyond our local context and allowed other educators to see how this problem may apply outside of our local context. And Ed went through this already, and he talked about two types of studies, broad uh, groups, intervention-based and association-based. So you can actually look at exploratory on the left side as association-based or actually keep it as exploratory. And the confirmatory can be both intervention and association. So you can see the qualitative on the left and the quantitative mostly on the right. And um, I think the 10 steps already talked about the patterns, you know, the theory, what is the theory? What is the hypothesis, predictions, observations, data? patterns, descriptions. Exploratory studies, on the other hand, they actually explore patterns and descriptions first, and then do observations and data. Hypothesis predictions may, not, may or may not be there, and you can generate theory. So you can go two ways, depending on where, what your starting point is. But always, always, always study questions, anchor the study design. That's something very important. Um, and next slide, please. So this is what we mean. The research compass is a wonderful Amy guide. So look at medical teacher and is well worth the read. So we talk about identify local problems, study the problem in local context, but take it back out to the world and communicate to other educators and other organizations. So what is the generalized, general researchable problem that may apply in their own setting. And uh, one of the things that allows us to do that is this concept well, called conceptual framework. So frequently you will find uh, journal editors asking the question, so what and who cares as far as our study is concerned? So we say, this is the problem I'm studying this is why the problem is important, not only to me in the local context, but to other people as well. Then the next step is going to be, there is a conceptual framework, meaning there is a theory, the educational theory, psychological theory, so psychosocial theory, that is allowing me to shape this study, or it could be a model or a framework, such as Kellogg's logic outcomes model. Kirkpatrick's uh, evaluate program evaluation pyramid, Miller's assessment uh, pyramid. So, uh, you know, six steps of curriculum development. So it can be a theory or it can be a framework. Um, and anyone wants to stop me later or email me and ask me more questions about conceptual framework, we can go over that. The next slide, please. And the research compass also, this is a beautiful depiction of how many types of educational studies we can do. And it's not just, fortunately, it's not, everyone's not expecting us to do a randomized controlled trial all the time. And they're no longer also believing in the hierarchy in the educational research world of randomized controlled trials being on top. All of them have equal importance. So let's start. I already talked to you about the conceptual or theoretical framework inside, which is methodology our worldview, our philosophy, our approach to the study, our approach to study design. And around it, we have different kinds of studies. Let's go over 
modeling studies are exploratory studies, descriptive, qualitative, but also psychometric studies. Um, and then if you move along, experimental studies in general are justification studies. They could be true experiments or quasi-experiments. Then if we move along, there are observational studies. These predict associations or relationships, classically case control cohort associational studies. And if we come uh, move along further, translational studies are implementing, taking study results and implementing them in real life. So application to real life. So that is um, Research Compass in a nutshell. So this is about ethics board applications. And for some reason, my, oh, there we go, finally. So why ethics approval? And it is to protect research participants from harm, from coercion, and from poorly designed research. Okay, so these are the big three. Um, and to know what's important, we need to know each ethics board is a little different. We need to know criteria for approval and particularly in different countries. We ensure that there's minimal risk to participants because a lot of our learners are vulnerable, considered vulnerable population. Reasonable risk benefit ratio, equitable selection, they do ask for that, protection of privacy and confidentiality, additional safeguards for vulnerable population. For example, if it's medical students, they, they are considered even more vulnerable than say residents, fellows and faculty. And so HMS has some strict regulations uh, uh, that you really need to follow through and ensure that consent is sought and documented in whatever form the ethics board deems fit. It could be verbal, it could be implied, it could be written, but we've got to go with the protocol. So the types of review, this is not for us to make a decision. They might come back and say, this is not human subject research, or they will uh, do a rapid review and say, this is exempt from further review. Um, expedited, they'll do it quickly. Uh, or if it's, they'll go to full review, which will take uh, a while. So what is exempt generally? Uh, three things, research and established educational settings involving normal educational practices, research on educational assessment, surveys, interview procedures, observation of behavior, all um, need de-identification of data and confidentiality. Research involving collection of existing data, documents that do not identify participants directly or indirectly. We cannot exempt ourselves. It has to go with an application. So the dues are submit an application. People ask, oh, do I need to do this? I, it's a QI. No, if you want to present or publish, just do it. Just submit it. Uh, complete city training. That is a collabor collaborative institutional training initiative. And answer, and we can, for education, we could do the social behavioral uh, section rather than the other, the uh, research science section. And answer all questions in the application, even if you think it's silly. Uh, provide all information about study methods and measurements, like whatever words we use in the main body of the application, the attachment, there needs to be an aligned attachment. Respond promptly to IRB queries, can contact them and speak to them. And all attachments should be consistent with proposed methods. Don't start without approval or exemption. Don't collect data without permission or assign control group without accepted standard of educational curriculum. Usual versus new is fine, but nothing go sit on the beach and hit coconut tree versus well, maybe it's nice for the control group, but not acceptable. Uh, recruit students or trainees who report directly to us. Uh, obtain scores on national exams without consent, skip consent, uh, or use data collected prior to approval. So these are some reasons for delay. Insufficient information upon which to determine risk benefit ratio. Study design is inadequate informed consent issues, privacy confidentiality issues, selection of participants not described adequately, it's like who's being left out, ethical issues not clear, poor oversight or data management, 
which board, remember, uh, med, if it's medical students, usually apply to the university medical school. If it's resident fellows, faculty, staff, it would be hospital board. So this is something I'm just uh, throwing up there. If we, uh, for people who do large multi-institutional, multi-site research, there is a central mechanism called I, uh, IREX and where uh, one board will seed to, I mean, all boards will seed to one uh, board, which is typically the PI. And this once uh, studies are registered, this is not applicable to most of my studies, but large database studies could be, uh, they will actually organize the data once it's registered. Use a submissions checklist. And I think we, I pretty much went through these steps before. And responding to reviewers, reply to each query. Clarify language if they say, and it's, it's, uh, sometimes it seems silly, but just do it. If they say additional fonts and documents are needed, do it. Be courteous in response, even if you don't agree. And with that, uh, that's rapid fire uh, tips for ethics approval. By the way, we do have um, a blanket education IRB approval from the BEI. So talk to us before you start applying for in individual project um, proposals, because maybe uh, we have an umbrella, basically. All educational project design implementation uh, evaluation but then we just need to know what kind of evaluation, what kind of data collection, who are the population, and if it's consistent with, and within the rules and regulations of the approved IRB, then you don't have to go through. I think Ryan and I talked about this already. Yeah. And I that, wanted, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to just add on and give um, a thanks to Christina and over on the Mass General side, Yunsu Park. Uh, for those who are within our Mass General Brigham system, Again, uh, there's been a lot of effort to try and streamline this idea that some so-called education research is actually non-human subjects research and therefore can be kind of exempted from that from the start. The next layer is it is human subjects research, but it can be exempt from oversight given the risk to benefit. And of course, the third would be your traditional IRB approval. But uh, Christina and Sue have really worked hard and it's continuing, so give it a little time, but to make those steps easier for us as medical educators from a timeline with the IRB. Yeah, for, I think bigger efforts are afoot, uh, but I started the smaller effort and then we have a kind of an approval for the BEI. Um, just one thing though, sometimes they'll come back and say, oh, this is educational QI and you don't need to, uh, but then they will not, it's not that they will give us an approval. However, a lot of journals will ask for ethics approval and that's a fix. So we'd rather get an exemption officially than say, oh, with the, the our ethics committee said approval is not needed. Three minutes left for any questions or comments from anyone. Eric, where does one get consent forms? So if, if you mean for an educational study? Well, for studying patients and doing research on their patients. So any research will have to go through the IRB. And, and if there is indeed an intervention um, of any kind where you need a subject approval, then that approval form has to be submitted to the IRB as well. So um, if that were required. When you deal with non-human subjects research, then oftentimes there's not a signed consent form that is required. Other questions or thoughts? Ed, you get the last word as well. Well, um, I think these are, they're all wonderful sessions. And what's nice in particular, the way Eric and Shuba and others have designed these is that they build upon one another. Today, we covered a lot of ground as quickly as we could, but that future sessions supplement and complement and delve into these issues. So uh, I, in, I invite you all uh, because uh, it's, a, it's, it's, as they would say, uh, downtown, a marathon. <laughs> Shuba, anything last from you? No, it was a pleasure to get this started and I'm looking forward to the other seven.
Spread the word to your colleagues. If others want to pop in for any single session along the way through the year, we welcome anyone. But we really look forward to engaging with our six scholars and uh, seeing you all back. Time is precious, and we ended just on time. So a th big thank you to Shuba, to Ed, and to the whole team, and to all the scholars as well. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Evening. Thank you.